Let's get this show on the road. Welcome to a mindfulness experience with access to Integrative Medicine Health Institute, the GW Office of Integrative Medicine and Health, and the GW Resiliency and Wellbeing Center. AIM is the first 501c3 nonprofit in the Washington, D.C. metro area to provide integrative medicine services to low-income and terminally ill patients, regardless of their ability to pay. The office is a global leader in integrative medicine, focusing on professional development and community outreach events like this one. The center takes an evidence-based, whole-person approach to the health, wellness, and well-being services that it provides to the GW community. Today we have with us medical cannabis coach Joel Rabion, who is with the GW Center for Integrative Medicine, and Nina Paul, the mindfulness instructor with the Department of Exercise and Nutrition Services at the GW Milken Institute School of Public Health. And she is the mindfulness-based stress reduction instructor and health and wellness coach at CIF. So Misha is here with us today, folks. I thought he was going to be a no-show because he already because he was speaking today, but he's here. Misha, well, what are you going to talk about? Yeah, so I, I feel bad because I probably I don't know if I'll skip next week since I'm doing a talk at the at the National Cancer Institute, and then after that I'm definitely skipping since I'm away for a week. So I figured I better show up. Um, that you see me dressed, so I was just giving a brain health talk at INOVA at their annual uh, brain health conference. Um, in fact, Dr. Frame is here. We have half of the CIM staff is here listening, so it's a pretty interesting conversation. Uh, but I'm not going to talk about brain health today. So a couple of things. First of all, COVID is up about 4% in our area. Now we're like the top 10 states in the country. Um, pay attention, mask up. I actually was sitting here in the main, uh, even when I was not talking, so I was wearing a mask because uh, I'm, you know, I don't want to get it. Um, so uh, also, I'm glad we're not in Florida. You all heard news probably that Florida just basically says people over 65 don't need to get the COVID vaccines because they protected, uh, that they sufficiently protective. Seems like... Uh, some states gone rogue on appropriate scientific uh, recommendations, but I guess that's what it is. We, we're we're not doing politics on this on this weekly event, um, but nonetheless, I think it's quite frustrating for those of us who want every patient in the country get similar treatment. All right. Uh, so today, uh, in addition to all of that, I'm going to show you what we forgot to do last week, which is the protocol when you're getting ready to get vaccinated. So I'm going to put the screen on. I hope you tell me if you can see my screen. You should be able to see the full script uh, protocol for the COVID vaccine support. Yes, we can see. Okay, great. So. Um, idea goes like this. You need to obtain four things. Uh, those of you who are my patient, you may already have this. If not, you can take notes. But of course, we're also going to give you a way of, I'll, I'll, I'll send Janet a list, Janet list to, to get this um, specific product. So you can order them from Fullscript on your own. So natural dehist, um, let me show you what that is. So this is a combination of a couple of different anti-inflammatories, particularly I would say more of antihistamines. So this is a little bit of vitamin C, stinging nettle, forcetin bromelain, and N-acetylcysteine. So these are the things that take the histamine notch down. Um, you should ask, well, why can't I just take something like Zyrtec or Claritin? Well, it turns out that it's probably not a great idea. A very strong blockade of histamine seems to potentially decrease efficacy of vaccine. So it's not really strongly recommended. It's exactly the same. Don't take Motrin or Tylenol. There is a thinking that those things do have some negative immune modulation and only take them if you have to. Like if you get a really high fever after vaccine, okay, we'll take Tylenol. But generally this is safer because you got no, no, all of these ingredients working together, but the effect is relatively weak compared to strong medications. Oops, I just lost the apologies. Let's go back to this. Okay, so then we have three homeopathics. Now it doesn't really matter what brand you get, whether you get the, this is Boyron, but it doesn't matter. So there's Arnica, which is often given for acute traumas. 
stooja, which is used for fevers, and I have no memory what silica is used for, but those are the three things. This is what you do with them. You may write this down, um, but it's also going to be recorded if you want. Um, so you take uh, 15 pellets. So they come in as little pellets. You take 15 pellets, one five from each. You take a bottle of spring water. It could be it could be just filtered water. You can just if you have a filter at home, you can just take a half a liter uh, filtered plastic or just any 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 bottle. Fil put the water in. Put those fifteen pellets. Shake quite rigorously for a couple of minutes and take it with you to the vaccine site. The moment you get a shot, you drink first a one third instantly, like right after the shot. The second third, you drink about 20, 30 minutes later. And the last third, you drink about two hours later. That's it. The dehist, you start 24 hours before and you end 24 hours later. And my recommendation is take two capsules with each meal. So it's two capsules three times a day. So you will need basically six capsules on day one, six capsules on day two. And you can absolutely use the same exact protocol for all of the vaccines. They are not specific to COVID. They've just been designed specifically for A vaccinations because there were the, all this concern that maybe some people will get a little bit uh, hyper-exaggerated inflammatory response after the shots. So this should help with that. Again, four things, natural dehis, two capsules, three times a day, start 24 hours before the vaccine and 24 hours after the vaccine, Take uh, 15 pellets of each to the side, mix with water, drink it. Now, you can also theoretically just take five pellets of each under your tongue, but that's a lot of pellets. Like there's three things here. You're going to have to like go one. It's just, it feels a little too, too much. It, it's easier to mix it with water. You can also get a liquid form and mix it. Um, again, it's, the, it's just a preference. These things are pretty easy to save after and you can reuse them in the future. You can do the same with the liquid but we just felt that this is a little bit easier for, for most people. It's the only reason why it's in the pellet form. So I'm gonna stop sharing and we'll do questions. Um, and that's all I have for today because we really need to give Joel plenty of time to cover what she needs to cover. Okay, Cecile, got COVID booster CVS, easy to register for an appointment. Got Pfizer, didn't know. Okay, no side effects, great, perfect. My prep for my vaccine was drinking a glass of smart water and taking kinesia and golden seal capsule before and also C regularly. Okay, and you took arnica three tablets. Okay, fine. So you took like you created your own protocol, which is you know a little bit different from the one I gave. Perfectly fine. Uh, will this protocol help reduce the risk of? Uh, well, that's what we hope. Um, I don't know, Randall. I don't know if I can answer that with certainty. We I have never seen this after any COVID shots. But again, that's my experience with maybe a couple of thousand patients at the most for the past few years. So I, I don't think that it's enough sample. Uh, GB, GBS is quite rare. I mean, we're talking definitely less than one in 10,000. It's probably like one in 100,000, if not less. So it's not surprising that we haven't seen any just because they're not common. Can this be prevented with this protocol? I don't know. And uh, it's a great question. Uh, if you're concerned, definitely take the prep. In the worst case scenario, it, it won't harm you and it will cost you a couple of dollars. This is the stuff is very cheap. The the homeopathics are probably $10, $15 each bottle. And then the the same for the small bottle of dehist. So and it will last you for many injections. So it's not just for one, right? Because you're only using eight, uh, 12 capsules of dehist. So you it, there's, you're there's going to have three doses in there. So you get and the same with, with uh, pellets, with homeopathics. COVID ever going to go away? Mm, yeah. Well, Hanifa, there are some people who claim, really high-end experts claiming that that's it, that the COVID is now going to be basically like a flu. Every year, we're going to have a micro pandemic and it's never going away. I don't know. I actually think that it will turn into a cold over time. I'm just hoping that it will turn into cold without long COVID. But for now, we're not seeing that. What I mean by that is, yes, most, more and more people have symptoms of the COVID just being a cold. But the frequency of long COVID is still there, meaning there's still some 5% of people from each infection will end up with long COVID. 
So then the reality is, you know, it's not the same as coal because of that. Even if the mortality goes down to a level way less than the flu, which is possible. Um, uh, expressions from no, there is no uh, cross cover between bird flu and the COVID, unfortunately, none. Um, so, so basically, <clears throat> I think I was asking cr critical question. As you all know, bird flu is actually again beginning to pick up. Uh, we now had fifteen cases in the country in all over the places, which is kind of weird because I mean, where would they get this? Um, so I will keep an eye on this. Uh, you know, we already covered it a couple of times. I'm sure I'll be covering it in the future. Is it going to be a next big thing? Hopefully not, but we need to keep an eye on this. Uh, where can you get the protocol ingredients? Yeah, so so I we will make a, it's on full script. Um, so what I can do, actually, I think what I can do is, um, let's see if I can create, if I can get a link, I guess, no. Um, yeah, what we'll do is I'll give you a general link to the full script right now, and you can, uh, actually, I'll give you a very special link. Yep. Those of you who are my patients, you know how it is. You can also message me and I can order it. That's another way. If you know me, you have my contact, by all means, feel free to message me. I wouldn't mind just to order it for you. And then this is the only way I can give you a discount. If you go on blindly, you're just going to pay a standard price. If you, my patient, I can give you a discount because it's built in into the or into in our on our end. But if you just order using regular link like this, it's not. It's just you're just going to be ordering because we don't. If, if you're not our patient, you can probably get all of this from Whole Foods, except for the dehist. I don't think you can easily find dehist, and also. Um, Retail brands often, do, retail stores often don't have 200 C potency and it's important you get 200. It's much more powerful than 30 C. So it seems to be more effective. All right, uh, Linda Evans got my booster. Thank you. Used Dehis Prep and Arnica had a bad headache that lasted about two minutes. So arm made better with Arnica and was a little tired, otherwise good. Okay, great. Well, that's what we hope. That's what that everybody will get through this. Swine flu. Um, Al, can you ask the question more clear? I, I'm not sure I follow any reports on research that link previous experience. Yeah, I don't. I haven't seen that. I haven't seen the links between other viruses to COVID directly. Whether there could be any protective mechanism or cross. I think COVID is quite unique. I mean, I think it's a, um, you know, it is a, it's the same family of viruses, my understanding, but it is different from from how, what what happens with the immune response to it. All right, I think it's good, right? I think we covered questions. If you guys have any other questions, feel free put them in the chat. If it's burning, if something comes up, I'll try to answer. Otherwise. Hold it till next week. I'll try to be there next week. Otherwise, if I'm not there next week, I'll see you in three weeks because I won't be there on the 26th. I think. It's wonderful to have Joelle here with us today. So as uh, Jan mentioned, she's our um, cannabis coach, um, but she'll tell you a little bit more about what she does. And it's wonderful that Joelle is here. Thank you so much. Thank you, Dr. Kogan. So yeah, I've been working in the cannabis arena for just over a decade now. Um, I have my master's in medical cannabis science and therapeutics um, from the University of Maryland at their school of pharmacy. Um, I got that in 2021. And I've been working at a um, DC dispensary um, called Tacoma Wellness Center. It's owned by a rabbi and a nurse. I've been there working with cannabis patients since 2020, early 2020. And I'm um, also um, working on a research project at um, Georgetown University's Lombardi Cancer um, Center that's being funded by the National Institute of Health and National Cancer Institute. And I mentioned this because up until now it was really unusual for these large research projects to, to receive funding because 
cannabis is still federally illegal and considered not medically useful. So it's great that these projects are now being funded. Um, the more information we have about uh, the usefulness of cannabis, um, the more the stigma, stigma will, will go away. Um, today we're going to talk about cannabis in the DMV. It's a really interesting um, situation that we have here because we have DC and Virginia and Maryland, each of which have distinctly different programs. Um, and it is hard to imagine that that cannabis is still federally illegal because we smell it everywhere. And we do hear a lot about its medical usefulness. Um, the truth is it's it's controlled by each state that has a medical cannabis program. And there are now only four states where it's still illegal. Um, Idaho, Wyoming, uh, South Carolina, and Kansas. And there are a couple of about half a dozen states where um, it's a CBD only um, program. Uh, CBD is another part of the plant that's very helpful. Um, it's not psychoactive. So other than those uh, situations, you can get cannabis across the United States now. It falls into two categories, recreational and medical. And it's um, illegal to transport cannabis across state borders, uh, even with two recreational states. And it's also illegal to um, send it through the US mail. So we talk about recreational versus medical. Um, these words mean uh, very different things. A rec state um, allows anyone to come and shop there as long as you're 21 years and older. Um, if you have a, a, an ID, a driver's license or a passport, just show that you're over 21 and you can shop there. Um, with, a medical, with a medical state, you need a medical cannabis card, which you can get from a physician like Dr. Kogan. Um, and uh, those uh, medical cannabis states offer products um, that are, they'll sort of point you, the people who work there point you to products that are medically useful for whatever your conditions are. Um, so, you can easily get a cannabis card um, for if you have if you qualify with something like chronic pain or if you're undergoing cancer chemotherapy treatment. Um, it helps with nausea, um, weight loss, um, vomiting, anything in the GI like Crohn's disease, MS, seizures, spasticity, anxiety, um, inflammation, fibromyalgia any kind of neuropathy, migraines, there's a whole host of medical issues that cannabis can address. Um, each state, whether it's rec or medical, operates independently. Um, they have their own unique uh, laws, their own prices, their own tax structures. In general, if you live in a medical cannabis state, that's uh, where you can shop. Um, DC and Virginia are medical states and Maryland is recreational. So we're gonna go through each one of the states um, in more detail, starting with DC, because that's where we are. Um, DC is really unique in that it welcomes everyone. It's a medical state, but you can, um, it's it, the, the cannabis is uh, overseen by a group called ABCA, the Alcoholic Beverage and Cannabis Administration. And ABCA will provide a medical cannabis card for, for everyone. If you live in DC, if you're a resident, you can go to the abca.dc.gov website and just uh, apply for one. You get it for free for six years. Um, and otherwise, if you're a non-resident, if you go up into any dispensary in DC, there are nine of them, um, before you enter, you'll get your card um, with the people who check check you in. Um, it'll cost, uh, the prices change all the time. I wanna say it's $20 for 30 days and $10 for three days, um, but it'll take a few minutes and you'll have a, a card so you can come in to any of the nine um, DC dispensaries and shops. And the, the, the dispensary, um, any, any dispensary that sells cannabis throughout the country, they track cannabis, they say from seed to sale. So they follow each plant along the way. So when you sign up and enter a dispensary, you're gonna have your name in a database um, that keeps track of what you're purchasing. So that if you come back the next time and you don't remember what you bought, they can point you to the right products. Um, 
Each state also um, caps a specific amount of cannabis that you can use each month. And in DC, it's eight ounces, which is kind of a lot. Um, so you can't use more than eight ounces, eight ounces a month, and it's on a rolling 30 days. And all cannabis products are taxed at 6%, um, except there's a holiday around um, April 20th. 420 is a national weed holiday. Um, so they have about 10 days around that date where there is no tax. And um, all the dispensaries will have their products very much on sale with huge sales at that time. But I really <laughs> don't recommend you shop at that time because it's very chaotic. I think um, last April 20th, we saw maybe 1,200 patients. It, it, it's really a lot. You won't get the kind of attention you deserve if you come on that day. Um, so all, um, all DC residents who have a cannabis card can can have the cannabis delivered to their home as well. You just sign up with the dispensary and request that it be delivered and, and it will come to your door, which is really kind of nice. Um, yeah, I have a list of the dispensaries and I can provide it to Jeanette after the talk so you can uh, see which one's in your ward and um, easily go and check it out. Um, one thing that's really important to recognize is that the dispensaries can only sell cannabis grown in their state. So even with DC and uh, or DC and Maryland being side by side, um, Maryland sells cannabis grown in Maryland and DC sells cannabis grown in DC. And in DC, there are five licensed cultiv cultivators and um, all of their products are subject to testing. Um, and this is for quality assurance and for safety purposes. Um, these uh, Cultivation centers are not open to the public, but there are five of them. And um, they have actually really excellent um, products to choose from. Additionally, there's one more um, kind of nuanced area in DC um, that started before the dispensaries were more um, readily accessible. Um, it started in February, 2015. There was an initiative called, um, it was, I-71, Initiative 71, that allows um, people to be gifted cannabis. Um, you can, they, these little shops are in kind of sketchy areas. They usually have to go down a flight of stairs. They get shut down all the time. Um, but you can come in, anyone can come in with a, an ID with, as long as you're over 21 and shop. And they're gonna sell you a t-shirt or some stickers and then they're gonna gift you the cannabis. It's weird. But um, the, the real issue with these places is that their products don't undergo any kind of testing. So you, you might um, order some five milligram gummies on one visit, and then you go back to buy the same gummies, and they might say they're five milligrams, but maybe they're not. So I really recommend that you shop at a legit dispensary um, instead of these I-71 shops. Um, and in DC, it's okay to smoke and consume in private residences. It's actually illegal to smoke in public, even though we smell it all the time. And it's also legal on federal grounds, like in Rock Creek Park or around the monuments, you shouldn't be smoking. And anybody can own and grow up to six plants. So that's the DC program. I'm gonna move on to Virginia, which is also a medical state, but very different. I see a lot of Virginia patients where I work and they all talk about how limited the program in Virginia is. Um, this is for a number of reasons. Um, it's organized by this group called the Virginia Cannabis Control Authority. It used to be run by the Board of Pharmacy and their um, approach is very safety forward. Um, you can purchase cannabis products, but they're very limited to, um, for example, five and 10 milligram um, edibles, you can't get anything stronger than that. The flour is very expensive. They have pre-rolls, live rosin. I saw two tinctures, a couple of vapes. There's a suppositories in one location. They just don't have a lot of um, products. They don't have a lot of supply. Uh, across the whole state, Virginia has 23 dispensaries. You need a written certification from a cannabis physician to enter um, a dispensary. You have to live in the state of Virginia and have your um, cannabis card, 
it's going to cost um, between $200 and $325 to get the card, and it, it's good for a year. Um, and there are, um, there are only, um, how many processors? There are five growers. They call them pharmaceutical processors in Virginia. There are only five for the whole state. And all five of them, no, I'm talking about the, uh, the dispensaries actually. So the dispensaries, there are 23 dispensaries, but they're all owned by multi-state operators. That means that um, the dispensaries are not mom and pop shops like where I work. They're owned by these corporate entities that have many, um, many dispensaries across the US. And they, they treat the dispensary just like a business to make a profit. So um, it's just a very different approach to um, cannabis. They don't, um, they don't seem to uh, work with patients a lot. They, they work with the, the sale, <laughs> trying to sell their cannabis. Um, so yeah, they, they only have five uh, growers for the 23 dispensaries. And then there's some interesting, um, other laws. So you can only have four ounces uh, every 30 days. DC was eight ounces. Um, and you can cultivate up to four plants. Um, DC is six plants. But the plants um, can't be visible from a public way um, without the use of binoculars. Um, and they're off limits by people under 21. And each plant has to have a tag that's legible with the owner's name, their license or their driver's license number and uh, a statement that the plants being used for their own or grown for their own personal use. And they can't convert the plant into anything other than um, something to smoke or tea, for example. Um, the, if you are found with a pound of cannabis in Virginia, it's a felony. Um, in Virginia, Cannabis is taxed at 21%. So that's very different from DC where it's 6%. Uh, 21% um, is a high tax, but actually the highest tax on cannabis in the US is in Washington state at 37%. So yeah, every state is very different. We'll talk about Maryland, which is a recreational state. So that means anyone can come in to Maryland and shop. Um, they're not going to give you the kind of attention um, that you might need because it's uh, it's it's meant to be or the approach is a recreational approach. You're just using this to enjoy cannabis. Um, it's the Maryland Cannabis Administration, the MCA, that oversees all cannabis in Maryland, um, whether it's the cultivation, the uh, manufacture, the testing, the distribution, and um, people are allowed two plants per household. If you're a homeowner and it's at the landlord's discretion um, and you can purchase up to one and a half ounces of flour per month on that 30 day rolling basis. Um, there's a 9% tax on cannabis purchases. It's the same as um, for alcohol in Maryland. And you can also get a medical cannabis card for Maryland, which will allow you to shop in um, the same dispensary, but you'll have a different medical um, cannabis menu and it will be a different price structure and you'll get more attention. So it might be worth getting that if you live in Maryland um, so that you get the kind of attention that you, that you might need. Um, it costs $25 to get this um, annually. And if you're a Medicaid patient or if you are at the VA, they'll waive that amount. There are 101 dispensaries in Maryland. There are 18 cultivators and 20 processors. The processors are the, the organizations that convert the cannabis into other things like um, tinctures and edibles. So that's it. Those are the three um, very different approaches to cannabis in um, the DMV region. And if you have any questions about this or anything cannabis related, I'm happy to, I'm happy to answer. Uh, folks, you can type your questions in the chat window. If you're not comfortable with chat, then you can unmute yourself and ask. Um, I want to highlight that the longer story is in the YouTube, uh, which we posted a couple of months ago, I think at this point already. 
Uh, it's about a half an hour long um, talk with Joel. Um, I think well, there's probably some repetition from, from this conversation, but there are more information there. So by all means, check that out. Joel, um, what do you think, what's the trend generally for Virginia? Because Virginia has definitely has been a lot more conservative and we're seeing very limited menu. A lot of our patients are kind of going to DC to get it. Do you think there's going to be, a, are you hearing any changes, any broadening of spectrum or quality of, I mean, of the number of products Virginians can access or is there anything? No, if anything, I mean, at the same time, they talk about moving towards a recreational approach. Um, I haven't seen any evidence of that. Um, I would look first at who, uh, which licenses they're giving um, to the dispensary owners. And because it's so corporate, um, you know, nothing's going to change until people, until yeah, until it's individuals owning, owning those places, but uh, it's, it's a very expensive endeavor. Um, you need to be hugely funded to, to start. Right. Yeah. Um, so yeah, it, I, would, it, I would be the, the reason The reason I ask is, I mean, from, purely legal perspective nobody cares anymore and we don't have i haven't heard any case of anybody being pulled over in the last few years but from federal perspective you're violating a law right so if you went to dc you picked up the product even with medical card and then went back to virginia at least in theory you just violated because you can't take the cannabis and transport it across the state lines again as i said nobody cares if you don't care you're not going to get arrested for this especially with medical card you know, but there's a sort of a violation. And so if you're very ethically oriented and somebody in the future, let's say you don't have a security job now, but you're thinking getting it in the future and somebody will ask you, well, has, have you ever done something illegal? I mean, in practicality, you're going to have to say, well, I did this and they may not like it. So at least yeah. theoretically, you know, it could be some repercussions. Although again, from practical perspective, you know, yeah. There's a question in the chat. It's awkward. Yeah, there's a very basic question for you in the chat. Okay, sure. So what's the difference, difference between THC and CBD? So um, the plant is a complex plant and it has all of these different molecules in it. And um, the, the ones that are most prevalent are THC and CBD. And the difference is that um, while they're both very healing, um, THC is psychoactive. That's what gets you high, um, whereas CBD does not. Um, often uh, people will uh, purchase products that combine the two because they, they work differently in the body. If you're somebody who has a lot of inflammation and it's painful, um, you'd use a product with both THC and CBD because um, the CBD will address the inflammation and the THC will address the pain. Um, that's sort of in a nutshell any evidence that marijuana can slow or prevent the spread of cancer. Um, I guess there, there is some evidence now. Um, these are, this is why we need these studies. We need um, more hard proof of, of, of this. Um, right now it's, it's just, it's tricky to talk about because there is some, but uh, in cancer, there's so many different kinds of cancer. And um, my usual recommendation with cancer patients is to follow the traditional medical protocol using uh, chemotherapy, radiation, and whatever your doctor is recommending, and add the cannabis to the mix. And I work very closely with a lot of um, cancer chemo patients, um, and they all find it very, very helpful, even for something like uh, what we call the headspace when they wake up in the morning and they realize they have cancer and they start to get into that very anxious space by using cannabis they can sort of push those thoughts aside and, and just uh, move forward with their day in, in a more calm manner yeah can i answer this real of quick course. so um you know there are a lot of case reports out there uh, every clinic that does a lot of cancer care claims that they've seen cases. We definitely have a couple of cases we've seen, um, um, you know, but then also we've seen a lot of cases where patients were taking all kinds of cannabinoids and didn't seem to do anything at all for progression or prevention of progression or spread. But the theory is strong. 
the theory that the cannabis will trigger apoptotic or cell death mechanism in cancer cells is very strong. So it's based not just in a theory in a cell, in a petri dishes, in the cultures, but also in the animal models. So something will pan out. Um, the question is what exactly will pan out when and how. And there's really no, no data to support at this time any specific anti-cancer recommendations, except to say that I recommend it all the time for symptom management. And I do hope that there may be some benefits that gets derived at the same time, and I'm sure. Joel does the same, so. Absolutely. And, I, and from anecdotal as evidence, I've, I've witnessed many cancer patients live a very nice, long, healthy life um, using cannabis. Protocols. You could make an argument that uh, when you make someone's quality of life a lot better, that they're going to hang out longer, right? Because yeah. they suddenly realize, wait a second, maybe my granddaughter's high school graduation is coming and I stick around. Like, I'm not kidding. So there, there could be some indirect, like non-biologically plausible or not biologically based effects that we're not capturing in statistics when you do the studies, but in real life, they're happening every day on very large proportions of patients. Sorry, I'm running out of juice here. Agree, 100%. Yeah, the articles that say the opposite, that cannabis can also contribute to cancer, especially the lung cancer when smoked. Um, probably, um, it's interesting it's though, I, I, I've never, um, I've never recommended for a cancer patient to smoke cannabis. Um, there's so many other ways to use it. Um, smoking would, would never be something that I suggest to a person. Well, there, there's a, there is a very strong data to say that there is no risk, increased risk of cancer or smoking cannabis for lung cancer. That's been done. There's been huge studies by this guy called Tashkin. Uh, there, there are two large uh, NIH-sponsored randomized control trials that they were expecting to see increased risk of lung cancer. It turned out zero increase. In fact, in some sub-cohorts, they saw decreased risk of lung cancer with smoking. We're not, of course, we're not recommending smoking, but this was done about 20 years ago. So this is a pretty old assessment that were done years ago. The only known cancer which increases risk in the use of cannabis is the testicular. There is no other known cancers that have been shown in any studies to have a higher risk uh, compared to non-users. We basically talking about smokers, not I mean, because all the prior studies have been done with smoking, not with. Misha, well, I'm somebody. sorry, but I'm going to have to interrupt and say that uh, we're eating into Nina's time. So we need to wrap up our bonus talk. Well, thank you so much. I appreciate the opportunity to talk to all of you. I had just one more question. So what's the best way to take cannabis then if smoking is not good for you? Oh, there are a lot of ways. There's um, tinctures there. It depends on what your issue is. Um, we can have a meeting and talk about it. Um, there are edibles, there are suppositories, there, there's a, a huge range of different ways of using it other than smoking it. Okay, thank you. Sure. All right, welcome everyone. It's great to be here. Uh, I My name is Nina Paul. I am a health and wellness lecturer at George Washington University at the Department of Public Health. And I teach mindfulness-based stress reduction at GWCIM. And I'm also a health and wellness coach. So today I'll be inviting you into three short mindfulness meditations. And mindfulness meditation is the awareness that arises when we purposefully focus our attention on, pre on the present moment with attitudes of non-judgment, acceptance, openness, and curious awareness. So they gently pull us out of autopilot mode when we go about our days on autopilot, being unaware, our minds often drift to worries about the future or regrets about the past. 
And mindfulness practice anchors us in the present moment, which can interrupt these stress-inducing thought patterns. And by engaging our, se our senses and body awareness, they activate our body's natural relaxation response, which can counteract the physical effects of stress. And with mindfulness practice, we're cultivating the ability to observe our thoughts and feelings without trying to change them or fix them. And cultivating this way of being with our thoughts and feelings uh, in a way where we accept them and start to let go of the internal struggle that comes from expecting things to be different, which is often a uh, major source of stress. Compassionate aspect encourages self-kindness, which eases internal sources of stress like self-criticism. So these are some of the major benefits of practicing mindfulness. And now we'll move into three short practices. So inviting you to sit in a way where you're comfortable and alert, upright, you can feel your feet against the floor to ground you in an upright and dignified posture. You can feel your legs against the chair, the touch points of the hands. And noticing the back, making contact with the back of the chair, relaxing your shoulders, relaxing the neck, the throat, and the face. So you're grounding yourself here in this awareness of your body sitting here breathing. And we'll start with the five, four, three, two, one technique, which is a grounding mindfulness practice that connects us with our senses. So I am inviting you now to look around the, around the room that you're in and notice five things that you see. Could be objects in the room, windows, lamps, furniture, carpet, the ceiling. So as you're noticing five things that you can see, you can name them to yourself. Now we, we'll shift to noticing four things that we can touch. So you might notice your feet touching the floor and the sensations of that touch. You can notice your legs touching the seat of the chair and noticing sensations arising there of touch. And you can place your hands perhaps on a desk surface or some other surface that's around you and noticing that sense of touch, whatever the hands are making contact with. And inviting you to notice something else that you can touch. It might be the lamp that's in front of you, your computer, noticing what it feels like to touch that object. Now we'll move into our sense of hearing. So noticing three things that you can hear around you. You can name those things to yourself. Three things that you're hearing right now.
Let's move to the sense of smell, two things that you can smell. Perhaps even bringing something up to your nose uh, to smell. I have a drink here, I'm gonna smell it. And then finally, one thing you can taste. So perhaps you're going to take a drink of water or something that you have in front of you. You can drink that and taste it or just simply notice the taste on your tongue, on your taste buds. There might be a lingering taste or a lingering uh, taste from something you had before. And so that was the five, four, three, two, one technique. And you can use it at any time to give your mind a break from thinking and just come into the present moment by activating your senses. And now we'll go into the second practice, which is called mindfulness of breath, body, and sounds. I'll be inviting you to observe these three anchors of attention. So you can close your eyes or have a soft gaze downward. Let's take a deep breath in and a long, slow breath out through the mouth. And now inviting you to return to the natural rhythm of your own breathing. And we'll start with paying attention to the anchor of our breath. So you might want to place your hands on your abdomen or your chest. And breathing naturally, just simply noticing the movement of the breath feeling your breath sensations as it comes in and as it goes out, moment to moment. So you're not trying to change the breath. You're just noticing how it feels as it comes in, as it goes out, moment to moment. You might feel the belly or the chest rising and falling on each in and out breath. You might be noticing your mind is wandering off into distractions, thoughts. You can simply label that to yourself as thinking or wandering. And each time you notice your mind wanders off, that's a moment of mindful awareness. And just gently redirect attention back to feeling the breath, breath by breath. Now inviting you to take your attention to hearing sounds. So you can even ask yourself, what am I hearing right now? Just 
just noticing the sounds coming and going moment to moment. Now inviting you to bring your attention to the body. So once again, taking attention to the body and noticing the touch points of the feet, any sensations arising in your feet, just noticing the sense of temperature or touch tingling, pulsing in the feet. And moving attention up to the legs. From the legs, taking attention up to the torso, you can notice the belly and the chest and the sensations arising here. And then moving attention to the neck and the throat, perhaps allowing them to soften. I'm taking attention to the shoulders, perhaps softening and relaxing the shoulders. Bringing attention to both of your arms, hands and fingertips. Noticing the back side of the body, the lower back, upper back, mid back. And then bringing attention up to the face. You can relax the jaw, relax the mouth, perhaps letting your tongue go loose in the mouth. Notice your cheekbones, the nose, the ears, the eyes and the forehead. bringing awareness to the entirety of the face and just letting it be. Breathing. And then finally bringing attention to the top of the head and scanning attention from the top of the head all the way down the body up to the bottom of the feet and the toes. Getting a sense of your whole body sitting here breathing. And as the meditation comes to a close, inviting you to send out appreciation to your body and all that it allows you to do to function.
grateful for your body as best you can. Sending it compassion. And now inviting you as this meditation is closing to open the eyes, come back into the room. Again, looking around the room that you're sitting in and noticing objects. Taking it in. Welcome back. So just a quick reminder, uh, I'll wait till um, Janet or Dr. Kogan comes back into the Zoom room here. Oh, there we go. So just a quick reminder, the next eight week mindfulness-based stress reduction uh, program is starting uh, next Wednesday. And the program will be held on Wednesday evenings online. Uh, you can get more information on the GWCIM website. So I'm hoping to see some of you there. Take good care. And I'm posting the link. If anybody wants to register or you just want to check it out, just uh, follow the link that's now in the chat. Uh, we'll make sure that that's also linked in the recording and in the description of the recording. So thank you, Nina, so, so much. Everybody, have a wonderful weekend. The weather has been blessed. So uh, stay safe. We'll see you soon. Bye, everyone. Bye-bye.